Monkey butt. Definition from Rondo Talbot's New World Dictionary. Monkey butt. A condition wherein a person has been riding dirt bikes so long his ass starts to look like the monkeys and baboons in the zoo. Coloration is often reddish or purplish, and the area looks inflamed. The condition is self-induced and is improved with a few days abstention from the activity of dirt bike riding. No known cure exists for the malady. For most of the last 30 years, I've been riding or racing dirt bikes, so I guess I qualify as an expert on monkey butt. The stories you are about to read are true, for the most part. Okay, so some of them are bullshit. Or maybe half true and half bullshit. Or maybe just a particle of truth and some politician-level embellishment. Quite frankly, time has a way of blurring what happened and what didn't happen. I'm not getting any younger, so I figured I better write all this down before the stories get so weird that even I begin to wonder if they were true or not. This is not so much a collection of bizarre tales as it is a portrait of a phenomenal period in time. It also chronicles the incredible rise of Dirt Bike Magazine and the behind-the-scenes madness that was part of that time. This was an era of new ideas, breaking ground and taking chances. There were no real dirt bikes before the mid-60s. Yes, there was some racing, but it was all done on converted street bikes. The dirt bike craze started in the late 60s, boomed in the early 70s, skyrocketed by the mid-70s, grew steadily into the 80s, then ran into the land crush and the eco-movement by the late 80s. Today, it's a constant battle to find open land to ride on, and the ever-present nature Nazis are hell-bent on eliminating our sport from the face of the planet. But there were simpler times, better times. Let me share them with you. Rick Seaman, somewhere in Baja, 1995. Forward by Paul Clipper. Yes, and here we go. You are about to embark on a strange and wonderful journey through the rise and fall of the motorcycle industry. And I can practically guarantee that what you read here will not exactly be what you thought it would be. The first day we met, I recall thinking that here was a person who was far too massive for the room we were in. When he came hustling through the office door, an immense vacuum suddenly took over the immediate environment. Papers and photos that were neatly stacked suddenly were on the floor or swirled around, as if in a tornado, by this sheer force of nature taking over the room. At the center of the tempest stood a man much shorter than his prose and a little wider than you expected. Teeth clamped hard on a marsh wheeling stogie, puffing out clouds of dense blue smoke. He didn't storm in shouting orders and making demands. Instead, suggestions constantly erupted into the room. What we need for this story is... The next project we have to get involved in is... Before we do anything else... You see, the difference between super hunky and the average egomaniacal lunatic is that hunky always spoke in the editorial we. No matter how ill-advised, self-serving, far-fetched, or potentially litigious his current scheme might be, he automatically included you in on it. Like it or not, he was intent on sharing the latest good idea with you. And if that ultimately meant you did most of the work, well, that was your share of the project. It was, after all, his idea. My experience with Rick Seaman started at what you could call the second ascension of Hunky. His rise to fame and meager fortune after the near ruin of Dirt Bike Magazine in the late 1970s. At the time, I couldn't believe we could save a sinking Titanic. We knew we were on shaky ground, so we had no fear of making waves, because any day the sheriff might come in and padlock the door. The following is an account of how this all started where it went, and what happened in between. Knowing Rick, I'm sure there's a number of things in here that will get both of us in a fair amount of trouble. But this is as close to the truth as you're going to get. It was a tremendous amount of fun, and I'll be eternally grateful that I was at one time part of Hunky's editorial we. Paul Clipper. Chapter 1, Story 2, 
buying my first bike. 1960, U.S. Naval Air Station, Sanford, Florida. We were sitting around the barracks playing cards when my buddy Bob barged into the rec room with a face-splitting grin. Hey, you guys, come on outside and see what I just got. Everybody put their cards face down and followed Bob out to the parking lot. Under the glare of a mercury vapor light sat a beautiful motorcycle. It was red with chrome sides on the tank and a starburst emblem with the letters BSA standing in relief. Bob sat on the bike. It's a BSA, a British bike. It's called a road rocket. It's 650 cc's and this son bitch is fast, let me tell you. I squatted down and studied the finned engine, the pipes with the blue tinged chrome and the steady drip of oil from the engine on the cement. So what's BSA stand for? How the hell should I know? It stands for BSA, I guess. A big, tall, lanky guy from Georgia named Howard cleared his throat and proclaimed, it stands for Bastard Stopped Again. They ain't the most reliable bike around. What with the shitty limey electrics? You should get a Harley. Now that's a real bike. Bob gave Howard the finger. What the hell do you know, you goddamn hillbilly? I don't see you riding a bike around. Howard bit off a plug of Red Man chewing tobacco before he answered, Well, I got me two hogs back home. One of them is an 80 inch flathead and the other is a knucklehead. Them's real bikes. This here BSA is okay for a kid to learn on, but it ain't worth a rat's pussy for putting some real miles on. You can bank on that. We all looked at Howard with newfound respect. He was not known as a bullshitter. And the fact that he had not just one bike, but two, was astonishing information. Bob fired up the BSA, and I was utterly stunned when I heard the raspy sound of the twin pipes rattle off the window of the barracks. It sent shivers up my spine, and I got goosebumps. Bob blipped the throttle a few times, then let the bike settle down to an idle. Well, I'm going to ride into town and find me some broads. See you chumps later. In a flash, I made my mind up. Bob, do you know where I can get a bike? I've got over 500 bucks saved up. He thought for a moment. Yeah, sure. I bought this one at Daytona Beach, right down the road from Ormond Beach. And the shop where I got it has maybe uh, a half dozen used bikes for sale. Some of them are right around three or four hundred bucks. I'm going to go back there this weekend to get this thing tuned up and have them put a new tire on the back. So if you want to ride up there with me, you can check it out. Great, I'm off this weekend. We can leave on Friday right after lunch. I got on the back of the BSA and unknowingly placed my life in the less than capable hands of Bob. He'd only been riding for a total of maybe ten hours in his entire life and half of that was on a motor scooter that he used to deliver papers. The BSA wobbled around quite a bit until Bob got up to speed, and we almost hit a few cars on the way out to the main highway. But once we got on the road, it was a simple matter of sitting there while Bob droned down the black roads toward Daytona Beach. It was a typical warm and slightly muggy Florida day, and I'd driven this route before any number of times in my car. But everything seemed different when sitting on the bike. You could see all kinds of things you'd never notice in the car. The cattle in the fields seemed sharper and clearer, and you were even aware of the surface of the road. Luckily, there was almost no traffic, which was probably why we made it to the city without crashing or riding off the road into a swamp. Highway 92 soon became a heavily traveled road leading into the Daytona Beach outskirts. Then I saw a bike on the left side of the road with a for sale sign on it. I tapped Bob on the shoulder, and he wobbled over the center line, nearly dropping the BSA on the dirt shoulder on the road. I hopped up the BSA, realizing that my legs were all stiff from being in the same position for the better part of an hour. After walking around the bike for a while, I ascertained that it was indeed a Harley. And quite a Harley at that. It was a full dresser, replete with a huge windshield, fat white wall tires, an enormous saddle supported by springs, and a pair of leather saddlebags with fringe dangling down, attached to the rear fender. It even had the streamers on the end of the grips. I sucked in my breath. Wow, now this was a motorcycle. While I was walking around the bike, checking it out, from every conceivable angle, a huge bearded man walked out of the nearby mobile home with his meaty paw wrapped around a long neck Jack's beard. You boys interested in this here 61-incher? I was puzzled. 61-incher? He nodded 
recognizing immediately that I didn't know my ass from my elbow about motorcycles. Yep, they got two kinds of Harleys that count, the 74 inchers and the 61 inchers. You can't really count them suck-ass sportsters. You might as well ride one of them faggoty, limey bikes as a sportster. I'm getting me a new panhead, a full 74-incher. That's the reason I'm letting this here beauty go. This bike runs damn near as good as a 74. Want to go for a ride to check it out? I didn't hesitate a moment. Sure, but I don't know how to ride a bike, so maybe you could take me for a ride on it. He laughed loudly. Ha! No shit. Didn't take a genius to figure that out. Even if you did know how to ride, do you think I'm dumb enough to let a stranger hop on my bike and ride it off? Do I look like some kind of fucking idiot? Actually, he did look like an idiot of the first order. But I wasn't about to point that fact out to a 275-pound man who looked like he was capable of kicking a bar door off of its hinges. So what do you want for this fine unit? He tilted the bottle of Jack's up and poured the remaining half bottle of beer down his throat without even swallowing, then let out a huge belch. Well, I'm asking $375. And since I gotta pay the rent on this here mobile home, and I'm picking up my new hog on Monday, I'll take 300 bucks cash right now. I nodded knowledgeably, as if I knew what I was talking about. Hmm, that's a fair price, as long as it runs okay. Okay, my ass, it runs great. Let me go in and tell my old lady that I'll be gone for a few minutes, and I'll take you for a ride. While I was in the mobile home, Bob leaned close and spoke quietly. I know this bike looks real good but you should never buy the first bike you see. That's an unwritten rule. Take your ride, but let's check out the other bikes at the shop I was telling you about. This thing will still be here if you don't find anything you like. What do you say? Sounds good to me, but I sure like this bike. The big guy walked out of the mobile home, which rocked slightly on its cement block foundation and slung a massive leg over the saddle. He reached down and turned the gas tap on, then did something in the vicinity of the carb, he clicked a large switch on the gas tank and a green light glowed. Reached up the side of the tank, he grabbed a knob and moved it around. This here's the shifter. You gotta put it in neutral before you kick it over. I was elated. You mean you can shift it by hand just like a car? Wow, that's neat! The big guy grunted. Yeah, not only that, it's got a clutch just like a car. Looky here. With that, he pumped a huge booted foot up and down on a large pedal on the left side. See? Works just like the fucking clutch on a car. Push it down and it's disengaged. Let it out and it's engaged. Even a moron can work it. Of course, you gotta have some kind of coordination. You put the clutch in, stick it into first gear like this. Then you get the revs up a little bit and ease the clutch out. As soon as you get going, get your foot off the ground on the floorboard. Simple as eating pussy and a lot less hair involved. Now stand back while I light the fire. He flicked the Kickstarter out with one thick finger placed his big boot on the rubber-covered lever and ran it through a few strokes with the clutch held in. Freeze up the clutch plates. They get a little sticky when the bike sits for a while. Carefully, he brought the kickstarter up to the highest part of the arc, gave a mighty boot. The bike emitted a chuff and didn't fire. He took a deep breath and repeated the movement. It gave a little cough, but still didn't fire. Shit! Fuck! Goddamn rat bastard! Cocksucker! ball, Shit! Piss! Cunt! Asshole! Whore! This man didn't go for fancy swearing, just the bare bones. Another ten kicks, and the Harley did little more than give a few half-hearted pops and bangs. Lousy motherfucker, shit-eating pile of rotten scabs, nutsucker, asshole, sniffing bastard, alley cat, tit and son of a bitch, pussy, one bald homo, fucking bite. Talk to me! Apparently, that last string of obscenities did the trick. On the very next kick, the engine gave forth a loud bang, and the Kickstarter recoiled back, smacking the bottom of his boot and driving his knee into his face. The big guy ran a finger over his lip, saw the blood from the split lip, and smiled. Good! Just fire up on the next kick. True to his word, the next mighty boot on the Kickstarter brought the beast to life. It rumbled, shook, vibrated, then clattered and roared, emitting a club of blue-white smoke from the twin fish-tailed exhaust pipes. Wrapping the throttle a few times, the big guy then let the Harley settle down to a rough, uneven idle that sounded like it would stall at any moment. Starts a little hard when it's been sitting too long. How long has it been sitting? Since yesterday. But when that sun bitch is hot, it starts right up with maybe 10 or 12 kicks. Anyway, get on behind me and let's go for a ride. I slung a leg over the huge Harley and sat on the back edge of the big saddle. It settled easily under my weight. 
The big guy bounced on the saddle. Sprung saddle. It's the only way to go. Takes some getting used to, but it treats your ass like a Cadillac on long runs. With that, he cocked the bars to the right side, clunked the thing into gear, raised the revs, and released the foot clutch smoothly. Accompanied by a slight shudder, the bulk of the 61-inch inch Harley, loaded with about 475 pounds of humanity, got underway. The big guy rode along the shoulder for about 20 feet, clicked up a gear, and darted out into the stream of traffic without even looking. A large station wagon locked up its brakes, skidding sideways as the Harley whipped into the lanes. It was unnerving. We almost got hit by that Buick wagon. No fucking way! Car stop for a Harley. You gotta have the right attitude when you ride on the street. Most people figure that if they hit you and they don't kill you, you'll rip their goddamn head off and fuck their pets. So they tend to cut you a wide berth. I digested this piece of helpful information and settled back for the ride. The big guy passed cars seemingly at random, ignored lanes, and rode so close to the doors that the grip streamers often fluttered in the face of the driver. Some of the drivers got a pissed off look on their faces from this, but soon looked straight ahead and ignored everything when they saw the size of the man behind the bars. He was intimidating. A red light blinked up ahead and we slowed to a stop. I noticed that his left foot depressed the clutch and he balanced the bike to the right side on his right foot. I was curious. I see you're balancing the bike on the right side. What happens if the bike sort of wants to lean over to the left side? He laughed loudly. Well, if you ain't got the fucking bike in neutral, you fall on your side like some kind of asshole geek. You gotta plan ahead and catch on real quick how to do it or else probably get your legs squashed. Another important item was filed in my mental Rolodex. The big guy rode around for about 15 minutes in the cool, moist air of a typical late afternoon in Florida, then headed back to the mobile home, stopped the Harley, flipped the long kickstand out, and shut the engine off. The engine made some tick-tick sounds of the hot metal starting to cool off, and I tried to analyze all the information that had just been crammed into my brain. Clearly, this was a big, heavy, serious machine that had to be treated with a great deal of respect. So what do you think? You want the fucker or not? I ain't got all night. There's a cooler full of jacks in there, and roller derby will be on in 20 minutes. Shit or get off the pot, pal. I mulled it over, and in a rare flash of intelligence, showed some restraint. Well, I've got one more bike I promised to look at in a shop back over there in D Daytona, and uh, if I don't buy that one, I I'll be back to get this one. Don't wait too long. This here fucker is a real eyeball popper, and people are beating my door down to get it. Tell you what, 290 right now, and it's yours. Take it or leave it. I'll get back to you, dickhead, he muttered, and walked to the mobile home, kicked the screen door open, and disappeared inside. The sound of a beer bottle opened could be heard over the sound of the passing traffic. Bob and I got back on the BSA and headed for the shop. We talked while we rode. You know, Bob, I actually like that bike, but it sure looks like it's a bitch to start, and I don't think I could ever get used to Always oh, stopping and leaned over to the right side. I had the vision of flopping over on the left side, right in the middle of a busy intersection. Bob shrugged his shoulders. Well, it seems like bikers are divided into two groups. Harley riders and everything else. Me, I like a light bike that starts easy. So anyway, the shop is right up the road here. Let's see what they got. Bob parked the BSA by the side of the building and walked into the back of the service department. Hi. I brought the BSA back for service. A short, muscular, red-headed mechanic looked up from the seat on a milk crate and peered over the gas tank of a black Norton. Yeah, roll it in here. Be about 20 minutes before I can take care of you. There's coffee on the top of the fridge and beer in the fridge. Take your pick. Coffee is free and the beer is 50 cents a bottle. Bob and I extracted a pair of cold long neck jacks from the fridge and poured some of the icy liquid down our throats. Bob stifled a belch. My friend Rick here is interested in a good used bike. What do you got for under 500 bucks? The mechanic wiped his sweaty brow with a red shop rag. Well, there's a Triumph Tiger Cub over in the corner for 175 bucks, and a Gold Star over there for 450 bucks, but it needs a top end job. Gold Star, top end job. The Gold Star is a 500 single, a BSA, maybe their best model, and the top end job means, means that it needs a fresh piston and rings and maybe a valve job. Right now, it's pumping a lot of oil. Bob looked at both bikes. Rick, you don't want the Tiger Cub. It's only a 200cc bike, and it ain't got enough power to pull a sick whore off a piss pot. 
and the gold star needs too much work to make it right. You could spend another hundred bucks making it right. You got anything else around? The mechanic looked around. Hmm, we just got this Triumph TR6 in on a trade for a new bike. I don't know anything about it, except that it looks okay and it runs. I think they'll let it go for around 300 bucks or so. Want me to fire up for you? We nodded our heads yes in unison. He walked over to the back of the room, crowded with bikes of all sizes and shapes, and rolled a bike to the only clear area of the shop. The bike was a metallic blue with a pair of straight pipes tipped with open megaphones. The mechanic reached down, turned the gas taps on, tickled the primer button on the Amal car, and slung a leg over the black saddle. He squeezed the clutch in and gave the Kickstarter a few easy strokes. Freeing the clutch plates up, right? I said. This caught the attention of the mechanic. Oh, so you know your bikes, eh? Well, I'm not one to brag, but I figure the more you know, the better a rider you are. Right, that's for sure. The mechanic gave the Triumph one clean kick and the bike ripped to life. The sound from the exhaust was positively electrifying. He wrapped the throttle a few times and then let the engine settle down to a comfortable idle. The Triumph sat there, contently ticking over a muted, throaty rumble coming from the cone-shaped megaphones. The engine seems good and tight and it ain't puffing any smoke. I rode it the other day and it shifted okay, so the gearbox works. I was hooked. How much did you say you wanted for this bike? The mechanic grabbed a clipboard and shuffled through a few sheets. Let's see, this here is a 56 DR6. And if we go through the bike in detail, well, uh, sell it for 500 bucks on the floor. But if you take it like it is, you can have it for 300 bucks, as is. Any kind of guarantee? He laughed. On a used bike? Are you nuts? Uh, tell you what, I'll give you a one week guarantee on the engine, clutch, and transmission. Everything else you buy, what you get. And don't even ask about a guarantee on the electronics. So, didn't take much thought. I'll take it. A half hour later, all the paperwork was done, and I was the proud owner of a 1956 Triumph TR6, my first ever motorcycle. I counted out the money on the greasy glass top counter, stuffed the title into my pocket, and went over and sat on my Triumph. The mechanic stuffed the cash into the register. You want to buy a helmet or some gloves to go with that trumpet? Yeah, gloves, black gloves, size medium. Ten minutes later, I sat astride my Triumph, ready to ride and realized I didn't know how to ride it. Uh, if you got a free minute or two, could you sort of run me through the controls of this here trumpet? The mechanic laughed. I thought you was a real biker. Okay, now listen up. Over here on the right side is the shift lever. Go all the way down for low, then neutral is next. Position up, after that, you keep shifting up into second, third, and then fourth. It's a four speed. You take off in first, and cruise down the road in fourth. Got it? Sure, just like a car, right? Not quite. Now the clutch is over here on the left side of the bars. The front brake is on the right side. If you don't know how to use the front brake, don't touch it. The rear brake pedal is over here on the left side by the foot peg. That's it. So why don't you take it for a short ride and get used to it? There's a big parking lot for a supermarket across the street. I'd recommend that you sort of putt around there for a while before you play in traffic. Any other questions? I had none, and much to my delight, I was able to fire the bike up on the first kick. Blipping the throttle was a kick in the ass. The engine immediately responded with a sharp barking rap of the exhaust. With both feet paddling, I nursed the bike out to the front of the driveway facing the road. Looking for a break in the traffic, I found one and clicked the Triumph into gear. It made a slight grinding sound that I later found to be characteristic of the breed. Glancing first right, then left, I found a break in the flow of traffic, then eased the clutch out, and promptly stalled. Kicking the, back, kick, kicking the bike back to life again, I raised the revs a bit higher and, and stalled again. Pissed off now, I really raised the RPM and dumped the clutch. The Triumph roared out of the driveway and darted into the street. The sound of screeching brakes and squealing tires ripped through the lengthening late afternoon shadows. In my haste to get the bike rolling, I'd sort of forgotten to check for traffic. Sheepishly, I wobbled off across the two lanes, ignoring the curses and fingers from the drivers, and headed for the supermarket parking lot. For the next half hour, I wandered all over the parking lot, learning how the bike reacted to open throttle, body leaning, braking, turning, accelerating, swerving this way and that. And during that half hour, I terrorized at least a dozen shoppers, scraped the paint on four cars, hit two empty shopping carts, and narrowly got hit by a Wonder Bread delivery truck driven by a chain-smoking Cuban. 
But by the end of the 30-minute period, I had actually learned the basics of starting, stopping, turning, of course, stalling, and restarting the bike. Flushed with confidence, I rode back to the shop and parked the bike by the open door of the service area. The mechanic looked up from a tire he was changing. Well, you don't appear to be dead or even seriously wounded, so I guess you'll be okay. A few minutes later, Bob and I were heading southwest again towards Sanford, in complete and total darkness. It was then that I realized that motorcycle headlights were not all that wonderful. The feeble glow from the beams of both of our lights was barely enough to illuminate our fenders, let alone show us the road ahead. We rode through the rapidly cooling Florida night air, while insects committed suicide on our torsos and faces. Every once in a while, a truly big bug would splat into us with the impact of a hurled peach. Side by side, we rumbled onward through the darkness. And yes, the ever-present night fog that's so much part of the Florida, then strange things started to happen. The triumph slowed down and the engine RPM rose. This did not seem like a logical thing. I figured that more RPM translated into more speed, all other things being equal. Then everything became clear. The clutch was slipping. Eventually, it slipped so much that the bike ceased all forward motion. We stopped and talked things over. Bob figured things out. Your clutch is dying. Let's just sit here along the side of the road for a while and let things cool down. I heard that if you let the clutch cool down, it'll start working again. The mosquitoes descended on us like a plague of locusts from hell, biting every inch of exposed flesh and flying up our noses. We could only take 15 minutes of this little taste of Hades before we fired the bikes up again. Sure enough, the clutch worked again for about five minutes, and it started slipping so badly that I couldn't even maintain any sort of speed on level ground. We stopped again. The bugs feasted on us again, and the clutch worked again for another nerve-wracking five minutes. Luckily, we saw a gas station up ahead, and the lights were on. We limped into the station and parked the bike next to the gas pumps. The attendant shuffled out of the office, swatting out the swarm of night bugs buzzing around his head. You boys want some gas? Bob held out a $5 bill. Nope, we got us some bike trouble. Could we use your tools? The attendant scratched his stubbly chin. Don't think so. The mechanic left at six sharp, and he locked everything up. All I got here is an air filter tool and a big crescent wrench. Will that help? Bob and I looked at each other hopelessly. I said, nope. Look, uh, is there any place we can sack out for the night? If we, uh, if we let the clutch cool down, maybe we can nurse the bike back to uh, Daytona Beach in the morning. Well, you guys can sleep in one of the old cars uh, out behind the station. Just don't wander around a whole bunch. We've got a big Doberman dog back there, uh, bite your nuts off if he don't recognize you. And he don't know you from Adam, so be warned. Bob and I chose the cleanest vehicle we could find. Mercury station wagon, settled down for the night. We put on our jackets and stretched out onto the seats. The mosquitoes somehow found ways into the Merc. In spite of the windows all being rolled up, their whining, buzzing sounds kept us awake for a long time. Then we resigned ourselves to our fate, closed our eyes, let the little rot rotten bastards had their fill of our blood as we slept the sleep of the truly weird. Morning came, with bright sunlight glaring through the dirt-encrusted windshield of the battered old station wagon. We got up, stiff, sore, and covered with mosquito bites. A trip to the filthy restroom and liberal douses of ice-cold water got us feeling almost human again. The trip back to Daytona took hours. The clutch would start slipping badly after five miles or so, and we would have to let it cool down, then proceed again. During the last three miles, the clutch was so far gone, the bike simply would not hook up anymore. So Bob had to push me by placing his foot on my rear fender and nudging the bike along at a snail's pace. Eventually, we got to the shop and pushed the lame Triumph into the service bay. The mechanic looked up from a crank-balancing V-block. So what's the problem, boys? I sighed. The clutch sort of died about 30 miles out of town. We spent the night in a 52 Mercury in the gas station from hell, getting eaten alive by mosquitoes the size of buffaloes and somehow made it back here without getting run over by bicycle riders. Now, if I recall, I've got a one-week guarantee, so if you can fix this thing, I'll get out of your hair. The mechanic shrugged. Okay, wheel it in here. I pushed the Triumph into the service area, and the mechanic laid the bike over on its side. In moments, he had the side cover off and the clutch disassembled. He picked the plates up and sniffed at them. Whew! These babies are cooked. There's almost nothing left. And what's there? It looks like beef jerky. With the dead clutch plates in his hand, the mechanic walked over to a large steel drum with the words, used parts, good, painted on the side. He rooted around, extracted various clutch plates out of the mass of parts, and compared the plates to the smoke parts. 
Eventually, he found enough satisfactory parts, took them over to a drill press, and laid all the plates down on the base to check for warp parts. Smiling with obvious satisfaction, the mechanic quickly and efficiently installed the new used clutch pack in the Triumph and buttoned everything up. Well, sport, you now got a decent clutch. I picked the best parts out of that barrel, and this unit should hold up as long as you own this here bike. Bob and I thanked the mechanic and once again headed for Sanford. The day turned murderously hot and muggy, and we stripped down to our jeans and rode the bare-chested way back to home. We cruised comfortably, Triumph and BASA, side by side. Exhaust rumbling. Life was good. I was now, for better or worse, a biker. My first bike, 1956 Triumph TR6.